to get us started, I, to get us started, I want to join, uh, welcome uh, Jeannie Monahan, director of FRC Center for Human Dignity, and Deidre McQuaid of the Secretariat of the Pro-Life Activities for the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. Deidre, thanks for being with us. You're welcome. Jeannie, thank you for being with us. You've done a lot on this, both of you have, but I want to start with you, Jeannie, with a question of how did we get here at this point where there is this mandate, and Deidre, I'm going to ask you in a moment about the really the, the strong response that we've seen from church leaders. Right. You'll remember before Obamacare was passed that Senator Barbara Mikulski introduced an amendment that basically had a number of women's preventive services that would be included right. with no cost sharing, no copay. Once Obamacare was passed, HHS was tasked with coming up with a list of what these services would be. They then consulted with the Institute of Medicine, who had a group of experts who met for a while. Deirdre and I went to these meetings as well and tried to get our two cents in, although we were <laughs> fought pretty ardently against, unfortunately. Um, eventually, HHS, this past August, came out and said that the full range of Food and Drug Administration approved contraceptives would be included in this list. And of course, that includes abortifacients. I'm sure right. we'll be going into that. They um, had a very small religious organization definition that is so narrow that only places of worship are going to fulfill that criteria. Um, then they received over 200,000 you know, protests, basically, from people saying this isn't right. Many of FRC supporters Absolutely. Uh, emailed in on that. Right. And then uh, just a week or two ago, right before the March for Life came out and reiterated their decision and said, no, this stands. And in fact, uh, with somewhat of a slap in the face, gave folks an extra year to be able to violate their consciences to be able to do this. Well, that so. should make them feel better. Right. <laughs> Deirdre, let me ask you this. You're with the, the, the Catholic bishops. And when this health care law was going through, I mean, we, you, we were talking about what the amendment that uh, Barbara Mikulski put on there that made very clear that these services would be covered. Uh, but there was always uh, the idea, because there's precedent for religious organizations being exempted. W was there concern at the time that uh, religious organizations would be forced to comply with provisions that violate the tenets of their faith? There was. The bishops were deeply concerned, and the bishops weren't alone. Uh, not only that religious employers would uh, fail to have an exemption, but also the bishops and others stand with the individual who, don't, who doesn't necessarily work for a faith-based right. organization or church. There are many more good people of good conscience who work for private organizations, nonprofits, companies, the, for the government even, who uh, should also be able to be exempt from uh, policies that offend their, some of their most deeply held beliefs. Now, the Catholic bishops have spoken out very clear on this. In fact, uh, more so than I've ever seen them uh, jointly speak publicly on a policy position. In fact, just today, uh, they had a, a joint letter that a number have signed on to that was published. Uh, so they, they, they are taking this very serious. They are. Um, under the leadership of Cardinal-designate Dolan in New York, who is currently our president at the USCCB, um, the bishops have really, uh, to use Cardinal-designate Dolan's favorite metaphor, baseball, stepped up to the plate. And um, they're making their voice loud and clear, but again, the bishops are not alone. This is not the hierarchy speaking, but not the people. Certainly. Um, it's been remarkable, the response from uh, the Catholic faithful and our friends, others who are also concerned, people of faith, people of deep faith and people of no faith at all who are deeply concerned. If you step on the toes of the First Amendment, of right. our constitutional rights, American people will respond. Yeah, and I'm going to talk about that later in the program, about how this is an issue of uh, religious freedom. It's not about contraceptive, uh, contraceptive coverage, but I, I do want to drill down on that just a little bit, Jeannie, because this is not just about contraception. Uh, this right. is also about drugs that can cause the abortion of an unborn child. Right. The full range of Food and Drug Administration contraceptives unfortunately includes a number of drugs and devices that can A, prevent implantation of a very young baby, its first seven to ten days before it implants in its mother's uter uterus, it can prevent that. Also, it includes Ella, which is the newest morning after pill, and Ella is almost identical to RU486 in its mechanisms of action, which means that this can kill a baby up to, you know, as many as 40 days of development. In studies with animals, it's caused abortions both prior and after implantation. So this is not drugs that prevent life, but drugs that also destroy life. And there's a huge difference between those two, obviously. 
Well, Jeannie and Deidre, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, please take back, uh, I know we communicate with the Catholic uh, bishops, the council, but uh, the commission, let them know how much we appreciate the work the conference is doing.